It's called the Dean Hope Center for Educational and Psychological Services, and it's the site where the doctor students from five different programs, including clinical counseling and school psychology, trained before they're ready to go out to the real world. And in that process, we serve our community. So in that clinic, which we're located at Thorndike Hall, we, we provide child therapy, adult therapy, psychoeducation evaluations, psychological evaluations, family therapy, reading, tutoring, and the list goes on and on. And I'm not going to keep talking about our training clinic because we have other exciting things to hear about here today. So uh, the title of our presentation is It Takes a Village, Raising Happy, Healthy Kids. And raising children nowadays raises many, many, many questions. As a parent, what can you do to naturally nurture the skills that your child is born with? Uh, we come from a culture where one size fits all, and as much as we know that our children uh, require more than that, uh, we tend to just have available the things that tend to fix to all. So, uh, but we have parents that based on their experience, based on their training, and based on them being parents themselves, have offered and have put all that together and have created opportunities that offer more than just one size fits all to parents nowadays. And that's what we're gonna be talking about today. What opportunities are out there that parents that are interested in seeking additional services for their, pa for their children can reach out to? I am a, a developmental psychologist. I received my PhD here at Teachers College with Dr. Brooks Gunn. And uh, at the time, I was, I, had, I was a mom already. Well, not when I started, but when I finished, I had two children. And during that time, I really thought about and read a lot about children, both from the academic perspective and the research that I was interested in, and then also thinking about obsessively thinking about being a mom, because uh, that's what happens when you get pregnant. And um, so my first pregnancy, I, I only talked to other graduate students who were going through the same experiences or who had. Um, and I came together with someone who also received her doctorate here. Um, and we, we, we just thought, where is the information that's reliable and valid, but not irrelevant. And, and how do we get that to ourselves and everybody else without just expecting that we'll get some of it on the playground or we'll read about it and not know whether those resources are legitimate or not? And how do you get that kind of support um, and information? So we decided to start um, a resource practice, I guess, for parents called Seedlings Group. And we started with before your child is born, because that's kind of where we were at. And we started to think about what we could do to help parents get ready for being new moms and new dads. Uh, and then it kind of grew from there into mother's groups. And we talked about, it wasn't, it, we were different than support because we really wanted to offer parent education. And it really has become a growing wonderful opportunity, not just to work with parents over the years because with ages and stages and milestones and stressors it all feels very important at the time but then the next few months go by or years go by and it's still things are coming up so we kind of uh, take our families from zero to six and then everybody well, I don't know what we'll do after that. I think we kind of go and go over this <laughs> <laughs> We hope they do well in school and we hear from them, you know, um, but we, we, we haven't been, we've been around for about eight years, so we stick with our families. But it's very, very cool and very special. I've been here uh, at Sahara's Man in such a long time that I couldn't, this was my floor back in, I think, 1989, but I couldn't find my way. Um, at the time, I went to uh, teacher's college at night. Um, I was working during the day at a few different schools, working with children within the schools, helping them to modify their learning styles, and also doing some psychological counseling at the same time. Um, but it was when I had my own children 
uh, that I, and when I was head of the Parents Association at my daughter's school, that I started to realize that parents really needed, they, so many parents were coming to me with questions about their child's education and uh, what their role was in their child's education. Mm -hmm. And from that, my company was born uh, called Your Child in Focus. And about nine months ago, I brought on my partner, who's in the audience. Yeah. Add, add whenever you like. Um, and what we do is we work with parents whose children are struggling at school. So we we work with parents whose children are struggling at school, and the first thing we do is figure out what is going on with the child. Why are they struggling? And then we determine uh, with the parents whether the child can stay in the school that they're in, or whether they're better served by changing schools. And if we feel that they need to leave the school we will give them a very individualized list of schools that can support whatever the needs are that that individual child has. But it doesn't stop there. We also support the parents in this decision as well because often, even if a child is really struggling at a school, they don't want to leave. Um, so we equip parents to feel confident that this is the right move, and we also help them to talk to their child about why it is a good idea to change, because often children feel like what they know, even if it's not working well, is what they want to stick with, and they just don't have the foresight to see that a change could be a good move. Um, the other thing that uh, Sabrina and I have done is developed a workshop recently that is for all parents even if their children aren't struggling at school and it's uh, to explain let's say the role of parents and how they ha can help their child succeed in general at school and it talks about uh, boundaries to place on children from early on that will help um, and, and that they will hopefully internalize as time goes on. It talks about, we just developed this, um, the learning environment to set up for your child at home, how to ask your child questions when there's an issue instead of uh, either getting frustrated or, or always offering a solution so that the child can learn more about their own working patterns and they can find their own solutions and also how to get key information from returned work like daily assignments, tests, and papers. Those are the ones you usually find crumpled in the bottom of their backpacks because they're embarrassed because they didn't do well. But it sets up a good dynamic between parent, teacher, and student where the student is really learning from the teacher and from the mistakes that he or she made and not having the parent intervening on a homework and correct feeling like they should be correcting their child's homework before they hand them in. And that's and also we talk about what uh, what to tell your child's teacher, what kind of information they want to know from the parent um, and what not to tell. Thank you. Okay. Hi. I'm Jill button schloss Both names really difficult to pronounce. Um, choose whichever one you want. Um, I also came to TC um, in the evenings when I was pregnant with my third child. Um, I have my master's from social work from Columbia, which I had gotten before I had children. And my oldest child was one of the first kids that I knew who was struggling in school back in the day before anybody talked about any of these issues. And I found it very isolating, very lonely, and had absolutely no idea how I was going to fix this. And it took me on a path, as well as my, whole, my husband and our family, and we found a boarding school for him that was incredibly supportive, that was incredibly warm and welcoming, and 
I remember when we drove up to drop them off, we were sitting in the parking lot watching everybody come out of their cars with all their suitcases, and he said, wow, everybody looks just like me. And I thought, yay, this is so great. And he had a phenomenal four years. It was the greatest experience of his life. And it taught me that there are a lot of different schools out there for a lot of different kids. And um, I am a specialist in boarding schools, both traditional and more non-traditional, something that fits my kid. Um, and my approach really is, what is best for your kid? And with my social work background, it's been very helpful with the parents to help them come to grips with what some of the issues might be with their kids and turn it into a really positive experience. And there are amazing schools out there that a lot of people don't know about. And when people come to me, sometimes they're freaked out about what's happening and sometimes they're known about this for quite some time and are just now ready to make that next step. And the kids are happy after. It, it takes a while. It's not always the easiest thing. And I also think people have a weird idea of boarding school that they're being penalized for leaving. But trust me, if you go look at any one of those most beautiful campuses, you have to go there. Yeah. So that's my background. But thank you so much. Okay, so in today's in today's world, we now often hear about the helicopter mother or the tiger moms because many parents are very closely involved in the lives and schooling of their children. I think we can all agree that caring and supportive parents are essential to the child's overall success. So here comes the first question. Is there such a thing as too much help, a point at which you're intervening or help is becoming counterproductive to your child's long-term success. When should parents intervene? So, <clears throat> so I'll start just thinking about parenting from that helicopter parenting and that kind of idea from early childhood. And I would say it's so tricky these days because helicopter parenting we know is happening and also a negative. But then there's the sense that at what point are you being a helicopter parent? Is it having information? Does that make you too neurotic? Does having too Some of that just a great thing because you're an engaged, active parent and how do parents balance that? So what I try to tell families that I work with is take first, don't listen to what I say 100% of the time. Always throw out 25% of what any parenting expert says because it's you that has to feel sane and healthy and normal as a parent to function as a great parent. And if you feel like there's too much to do and there's too many you know things you can get wrong, you'll, you'll get stuck in that that place and you can end up being a helicopter parent inadvertently just out of panic that you're gonna mess up. Um, and, and then I would say in general, particularly in New York, um, it's really easy to forget how incredibly rich the environment is here in, in early childhood and for infancy. Just as parents, there are so many resources and just walking down the street, you can, you can teach and learn so many things with your child. So backing off tends to be a huge conversation um, and convincing parents that learning through play is the most beautiful way to learn and that that serve and return, the idea of responsive parenting and watching your child and letting them take the lead is a much better balance than deciding and having an agenda for your young infant or child and, and making sure that they learn extra, extra well and do everything better, stronger, faster. So that seems to be a, a conversation that starts truly at birth. Um, I see parents just desperately trying to get it right. And so once we talk about removing that, you're never getting it right. Like none of us will get it right. So that is a guaranteed fail and it's something not to try to to attain, it's just unrealistic. So better to just do your best and have that same attitude with the kids and that's kind of what my approach is and I, I hope that helps calm people down. Um, I'm of two minds. On the one hand, when it comes to something like school choice, I think there are choices that parents have to make and they're not always popular choices and I think you have to stick with them and in that sense you have to take the reins as a parent. 
On the other hand, if you try to rescue your child at every bump in the road, you're going to rob him or her of the opportunity to make mistakes and to learn from those mistakes. And then you get some degree of learned helplessness. And when it comes to school-aged children, um, I believe that there are is a lot to be learned at school besides just academics. And um, some of the things that need to be learned um, and can only be learned when, when a parent backs off and lets a child make his or her own mistakes are they need to learn to advocate for themselves. They need to learn to problem solve. They need to learn to deal with a tough teacher. They need to learn to tolerate struggling and not having answers and not having perfect situations as well. And uh, they need to learn to do poorly in a subject that they can survive. Having said that, um, if a child is struggling across the board at school and their self-esteem <clears throat> is being affected, they're beginning to give up at school, uh, that is a stage you have to keep your pulse on where your child is at because at that point you do need to intervene and, um, and talk to the school and talk to some experts about some uh, solutions for the child. I have a lot of parents that come to me and say, well, if I send my kid off to boarding school, how am I going to help them manage their day? How am I going to do their homework? And I look and say to myself, should be doing their homework. Um, I think being an involved parent is an incredibly important thing to be, and you can be an involved parent from a distance as well. I think in the boarding school world, kids learn independence in a whole different way than they would learn if they're at home. And as a parent, you go see your child. You go watch your kid if they're playing baseball in Central Park. You'll go watch your kid if they're playing ba baseball at a boarding school. The kids don't notice the distance, even if it's just 45 minutes away in Connecticut or New Jersey. You might notice it because you're the one doing the travel, but it's not about you. It's about what is best for that child. And if they're someplace where they're getting all the nurturing and the homework help or you know, study guides at that school, it doesn't become about the parent anymore. You don't have to be the one hovering over them. So when they come home, and trust me, they come home a lot, you get to be a parent. You get to be the mom or the dad and the brother and the sister, and it's not about homework, and it's not about being the disciplinarian. It's about having a family and having a really awesome time together because it's not about work. So that helicopter piece kind of goes away, but still allows you to be the most fabulous parent that you can possibly be without all those other stressors. Could I add one more, um, one more thing, just thinking about sure. what everyone was saying? One, one thing that can start very early is to set your child up for success is, to your point, letting them have small failures and having the ability to control their own choices in very small ways, obviously starting early on, so that they can later fail beautifully. So that by the time they're in high school, they can fail in a way where they feel great about it because they have this new thinking process of when you fail, you get to learn something. And if taking on challenges becomes the great thing and the kind of the conversation in your household, like how was your day to day isn't, what, you know, what, what did you do well today isn't the question, but it's what, what, what'd you fail at? What was the cool thing you learned today? Then you can really get to a point in, in high school where you are off and whether it's boarding school or, or locally, where you can function without having hovering parents. And it, then it helps the helicopter, the feeling of being a helicopter parent, um, disappear and also if you want to get it right knowing that failing is going to teach your children something can kind of help that process along can I, add that? I think we often think of failure as like not doing well academically that's where we kind of see failure first failure can be trying out for a team working as hard as you possibly can to make that team and then not make that team and you know 
going back to what that represents, what you've learned about that, what you learned about yourself, that you fell ice skating a bazillion times trying out for the hockey team, but you learned how to ice skate. That's an incredible good side of failure. So I, I think you have to look at failure in smaller little pieces, not like the big broad, oh my God, they didn't get into the program I wanted them to go to, but they, they learn something about themselves. And every single day, that's a really incredible goal to have and feel really good about yourself that you tried. Trying is overrated sometimes. You need to just try it. Might not always like it, but try it. And, uh Sometimes one of the hardest things you can do as a parent is watch your child flail. And I know my daughter went to sleepaway camp for the first time, and she kept writing these letters with tears on it. And my heart was broken, and I just wanted to bring her home. But she stayed. She stuck it out. She felt good at the end for having done that. And believe me, it was harder on me than it was on her for sure. And she learned the lesson of you stick things out even when they're not perfect, even when they're hard. So there are lessons and it's hard for a parent sometimes to let go. It's sometimes harder than jumping in and fixing it. But we rob our children if we jump in too much. Thank you so much. As a clinical psychologist, I would like to share with you an experience I have many years ago when I was working in a hospital, and it's like the extreme, actually, of what is being described here, of a child that is not giving opportunities to, to fail, and how much they can learn from failure. Uh, there was, this, was fam this family that had this only child, and they provided everything for this child, everything. This child never had an opportunity to say, I want this, because the minute he asked for it, he will get it. Guess what? He, got to, he never was thought to ride a bicycle because they didn't want him to get hurt. He got to 16 years old, and guess what? He fell in love, a developmental, a normal developmental need. He fell in love with a, a girl, and the girl rejected him. And guess what happened? He had a breakdown, an emotional breakdown. And to make the story short, he ended up in an emergency psychiatric room. And, the, and, the, and this is like the extreme of a case of a child that is not given opportunities to fail and figure things by themselves and get up. So uh, let me move now to the next question. It used to be that the concept of the right fit was most often associated with selecting a college. But today, there are many schooling options for pre-K to 12. Tell us more about what types of schools exist now and how important schools fit is to be with the child's success. I mean, I can, do you want to do pre-K or do you want to start? Sure. Sure. Go ahead. The beginning of the structure that you said that is needed in the beginning. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so in terms of the opportunities in, in the beginning for children, all of the the preschools and actually now they have twos programs before the preschools um, a lot of parents are wondering how to find the best fit for their child but they have no idea who their child is and so one thing we know for all children that are two is that they just need a place to explore so that they can figure out how things work and how to take risks because even in their play even trying to make a puzzle fit a puzzle piece into something that is a little bit trickier than they've done before is a risk academically so and intellectually even for these little two-year-olds and socially they need to engage with each other and for me what I tell parents is just make sure that the art in the room looks different and that the projects that are going on are led by the children at that age because at the end of the day even if your child needs a little bit more structure um, that kind of structure and programming probably is not going to be relevant in the early childhood years. Uh, later on, it is more relevant, and there are um, many different kinds of schools, and finding the right fit for your child uh, is not easy. And the great news, um, it, it's best to see if you're a school will have the right balance of struggle and challenge, I feel, in within the school. 
But the good news in New York City is that there are tons of different kinds of schools available, and the bad news is that there are tons of schools that are available. And they're in different categories, but there's variability within those categories as well. There are schools for learning disabilities, but even within those schools, there are certain schools that only will accept children with a certain kind of learning disability. Uh, there are other schools that will accept uh, children w on the autism spectrum or not. Then how they deal with the children is different as well. They have push in, pull out. They have um, many different kinds of programs. Some of them work one-on-one -on -one with children part of the day. Some of them do the small groups with children with the same types of learning disabilities, and that's just one category. The next category, there are mainstreams with, with programs on the side that could help with a certain amount of children with learning disabilities, and then there are the vast amount of mainstream schools that have the same curriculum, but they deal with children in many, many different ways, and they support children in different ways. So it's difficult. You have to ask a lot of questions. Don't just find a school that your friend found for their child. Think about who your child is and try to match the kind of atmosphere, the kind of structure, the kind of support that you think your child might need. And then as time goes on, keep reevaluating it because just because you started kindergarten doesn't mean that in fourth grade, fifth grade, eighth grade, that that school will be right for your child and be ready and willing to leave if it proves not to be the right atmosphere. I try to tell a lot of the kids that I see who are in schools that go all the way through 12th grade to first ask to see what the high school looks like. Go for a tour, even though you know what that building looks like, go see the high school. Go see one or two other schools just to make sure that where you are still fits for you because your parents made that decision for you when you were six, seven, eight years old. And now you're a little bit older and you have an idea of who you are and what you want. So go look. There is nothing wrong with looking. So at the end of the day, with where you are is where you want to be, then you've made that choice. And then in terms of boarding schools, a lot of people think of you know, Andover, Exeter, Choate, those types of schools, which are amazingly beautiful, phenomenally academic schools. And I think we think of boarding school in a very different way 10 years ago than they are really actually now. They've become much more kind of niche schools. There are schools for, there's an amazing school out just outside of Boston for the arts. If you draw, paint, act, sing, dance, your academic day is in the morning and the afternoon is all about your art. And because you're so close to Boston, you can get into the city. The school arranges programs in theaters, in art galleries. There are kids that play with the Boston Symphony. What an amazing opportunity if you have a child whose passion is something along those lines. There are so many different schools that have so many different ways of looking how to educate kids, how to foster growth in kids, in helping them figure out which is the right folder to put their homework in before they go off to class. All of those things are an incredible experience. They have them you know, in, in the day schools as well, but they also have all of those programs in boarding schools too. And I don't think the parents don't always think about that opportunity for their child because they think they're sending them away, but it's a really amazing experience for them. You. Thank you. Tell us some of the ways in which you provide guidance and consulting to parents and other caregivers on a day-to-day -day basis. Like if you could give examples of some of the parents that come, have come to you with some of their questions and concerns and how you have guide them. Uh, so I typically start with parents that when they first have their babies or when they're pregnant and they meet in groups. Um, but also the services that we provide are specific to a particular, can be specific to a particular challenge. The challenge is usually something like sleep or um, some positive discipline, some 
some need for a family toolbox for how to respond to difficult things. So a lot of the things that I do, the services are very much not, it, we're not geared toward looking at issues. We're looking at the family as a whole and helping them just parent their normally developing children with the tools that make them confident in the decisions that they're making. And you know, it could be as simple as they're having some struggles with potty training or their child was not sleeping through the night, but it can get as tricky as um, certainly some behavior issues that are infiltrating school and they have, they've been referred because they need their own plan. So even if the child is it, currently in therapy, we work with the therapist so that the parents have a program as well. So it's really thinking about just a healthy toolkit for families. Uh, and we work with parents uh, whose children are, are at a range of different areas in terms of um, their struggle in school. And the earlier we can get to um, a parent whose child is struggling, the better we can have, a better solution we can provide. Unfortunately, often we're called in when the child has already given up or um, they are really not trying at school, they're, they're not doing well at school, the application process may be already finished for that semester, and then there are fewer and fewer options open. So if it's possible to start with a family earlier on um, and, and talk about either things that they can do to help their child right then in their school, interventions, targeted interventions that they can make, that we can help them make, that's ideal. And then if they need to apply to a different school, then we will continue and provide support for the parents and a list of schools that we think the parent should look at for their child. Um. I get families that have kids that are doing well at school, and I have families that the kids are doing phenomenally well at school. Um, I was just thinking when you wanted to ask for an example, I had a family come to me. Uh, it was the fourth child in a family. All the kids had gone to the same school, and the daughter was like, I want out. I don't want to follow my siblings. I want to go to boarding school, and the parents were Panicked. They were like, how is this possible? How can, you, how can you leave? What are you going to be doing? And she pushed really hard with her parents to allow her to explore this incredible opportunity. And they came to me, and we discussed all the different choices. And they went off, and they saw some boarding schools. And happily, she's ensconced in boarding school and having an amazing time. She found her own education. I spent a lot of time while their daughter was away with the parents making them feel okay about the fact that their daughter was having a really good time and was just doing fine. Uh, they got the phone call one day that she was feeling a little homesick and the mom called me and said, I'm bringing her home, this is awful. It's like, no, it's a really great sign that she's homesick, she likes being at home, that's a good thing. Doesn't mean she can't be at school, doesn't mean she doesn't do well at school. Give her a moment, take a breath. You're gonna have a really bad day. She's probably off with her friends having a really good time. She'll maybe text you tonight and say, what are you talking about that I said I was homesick before? So uh, I do a lot of work with parents even after the kids leave. Um, in August, I usually get the phone call of, okay, what do I buy at Bed Bath & Beyond? What sheets do I get? Things like that. I am happy to answer all of those questions. Sometimes you just need a little guidance because it's unknown and unknown is scary. So it sounds to me, I mean, you just said it at the end there, that it, it's, there's like a coaching process that goes on with the parents too in the process of adapting to the children being away in a school, in a boarding school. Okay, thank you so much. At this point, I would like to open uh, the floor to any questions that you might have to any of the, our distinguished <coughs> panelists. Okay, where do we start? Okay, uh, two quick questions. One, Lisa, imagine that parents are so overwhelmed having this and Barnes and Noble and on the web, et cetera, and the idea of you providing sort of evidence-based um, assistance and ideas, et cetera, do, is it often counter to a lot of what we think is the way to do things or not do things? Um, 
I, th I do think that uh, I often am sitting with parents in a situation where I'm contradicting, but of course, evidence-based, but it, the evidence contradicts what their, even their pediatrician said, um, and their families have said, and it's such a tricky position, because, and their caregivers. So it's a tricky position to be in because, um, you know, what I try to say is, I'm gonna stick with what I'm, the, what I know is in my domain, and what I've made sure is evidence-based, and um, they, at, they grow to trust this, but I don't go outside of that, so I'm not gonna tell them even though they ask a lot of question, questions like about products or sippy cups or whether they should co-sleep or sleep in the other room. Th these, are not, these are not research. R the research is they just need to get their consolidated sleep. So I'll help them with that. So I try to make those distinctions, but then when something's counterintuitive but it's evidence-based, I usually give them the research. I, I'm very um, careful about making sure that I've combed through and made sure that I'm giving them high quality research. And then they feel pretty good about it. And I also, my other hat is that I'm the co-director of the parenting center at Mount Sinai and I only work with the pediatricians and our entire goal is to sort of transform pediatric care so that the care providers have the same parenting training that they are thought to have had when the parents are talking to them and they actually don't. So um, I, I've now become I've, I've gotten such a neat experience understanding where the pediatricians are coming from when they talk to parents. So I usually can have that conversation with them um, more easily because I can, I can pretty much guess what their pediatrician said. Um, and, and then it's just also being respectful that all the opinions are great, but sometimes because it's overwhelming, I'm just there to help them kind of get rid of the noise. Mm -hmm. and. Um, Usually, after a while, things like sleep beget sleep. Those the, t telling um, parents that have a baby that's waking up at 5:45 in the morning that if they put the infant to bed earlier, that it will be a very quick fix. It's really hard to convince parents of that, but when they try it, it it almost always works. It's just I have to tell them, "You can wake me too." <laughs> if I was wrong, you could wake me. Um, and so we we have a lot of those conversations, but. It's interesting. You would like to respond to the question? Um, the, the only thing that I will add is that when we were talking earlier is um, on, the, on the phone is that sometimes what you start as parents w with infants, uh, you forget to continue and you can f forget something like the importance of sleep. And in our workshop, that's one of the things we discuss, that if you start habits early on for school-age children and keep them going in middle school and high school, something like sleep is so important. And most of the kids are sleep deprived and they can't concentrate at school and it becomes a vicious cycle because they can't get their homework done and they're up till two o'clock in the morning. They need a bedtime, they need those boundaries and whatever kinds of boundaries you're putting on your child when they're younger, keep them going in school. A lot of boarding schools have lights out. Yeah. You know, in, no, I'm serious, internet is off and lights out. So, you know, freshman and sophomore year, they're at a certain time, junior and senior year, it's a little bit later, but lights out. And if you're caught, you know, reading with the flashlight under your sheets, you're not penalized, but you're talked to and are explained why sleep is incredibly important. So. I'm, I'm an advocate of sleep. Okay, there was a question on this side. Yes. He's so cute. And I don't want him to go. So would that be would that be an option? I was just wondering if you have a standard or protocol in place to know how far I would willing to allow this person. Depends on how hot the water is. Totally. If you if 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 you if you I always think I think it depends on how hot the water is, is it phenomenal? 
um, metaphor <laughs> because just to take that everywhere. Because if it's just really hot and it'll be an ouch, but then let them touch it. But if it's gonna scald, you know, it's it's time to stop them. And and I think um, as they get older, the definition of that will change. I imagine failing, and before high school, I know my, my um, for for everything that doesn't count on their record, um, it's such a wonderful opportunity. That's what it's there for, to give children the chance to do all the things that they're gonna need to do to learn best and to fail the best and to get what they need out of it so that by the time they are on record, um, they'll do great. Even when they're on record, they right. can, it's okay. I just don't know anything about high school. <laughs> I do. <laughs> um, it's, yeah. yeah, it's okay. <laughs> it's okay. We both have children who are, uh, one of mine's past college, one of mine's about to graduate college, and it is okay to let them fail. The analogy that I think of um, in terms of allowing your child to fail is one where if you're teaching your child to swim, if you're holding them up the whole time as they're going across the pool and they're not really swimming, they're not really learning to swim. If you give them the skills, certain skills that they need to learn, you let them go and they start going, they're gonna go under at times. And that's okay, because chances are they're gonna pop back up. Once they start drowning, then you gotta jump in. So I guess back to the analogy of how hot the water is. So uh, jump in when you need to, but let them have the kinds of lessons that they will learn on their own and the problem solving skills um, that they get along the way. I'm gonna just say being a parent is ridiculously hard. And knowing those boundaries, they fluctuate all the time. I don't think there's always one right answer to say the temperature of the water has to be a certain temperature for him to touch it because it, it might change. It might feel different on a really cold day on a really hot day. So being flexible, being um, aware, being watch, watchful, but it's not easy. And certainly not easy watching your child touch the water when it's hot and get the boo-boo. And I will add to that that uh, it has to do also with the child. You might have more than one child and one might have a different level of tolerance than the other. So it, it calls for that as well. And parents have to trust that they have great intuition with the children. And they have a great sense of how much their child can tolerate or not. And also is how do you approach when a child fails? It's not the same to say, okay, you got an F, you have to do better next time. I supposed to say, okay, what do you think you didn't do this time? that you could do next time. So you are helping them to deal with that in a different way. You're ask, you, you are helping them to, prob, to problem solve in a different way, and they don't associate failing with not meeting the demands of a person, in this case, daddy or mom. But I am learning that it's okay to fail, and now mommy and daddy are teaching me what can I do that I didn't do the last time that I could do now to do better. And, uh, and also, mommy and daddy fail too and we make mistakes all the time and that's okay and we don't have all the answers my daughter came to me and said well in high school she was a junior or senior and said they've told me that I need to do this activity it will look good for colleges what do you think and I said I have no idea and honestly I don't think anybody knows what colleges want so if you want to do it do it if you don't might have been a m mistake, but we make mistakes as parents, and it's important for our children to see that we make mistakes as well, and that's part of learning, and that we can shrug them off, and that was the wrong decision, that's okay too. I really, I, I hope that we can all celebrate our children's mistakes, so if they, I mean, certainly if your child studied so hard for an exam and they got an F, and your other child did nothing and got an A, I mean, it's all Carol Dweck, but, I'm putting that F up because I'm, I'm, we'll figure out what went wrong, but I'm really excited about the F and not the A. And I think that that attitude will have to also be kind of a conversation in the whole family so everybody agrees with it, but that's what can help them when they're, when, when we're kind of deciding what 
what that failure is or boiling water is. <laughs> Thank you. Um, George, you had a question? Yeah, thanks. Uh, as a father of a 14 year old who used to love math, she did math puzzle books for fun. Now, as a freshman in high school, she's gotten really frustrated, unhappy. You know, she thinks she's bad at math. Um, I went to talk to her teacher. Her teacher says it's all about the test. Get the right answer. Because it's not about the question, it's not about learning anymore. So I don't know how to, uh, it's with a child's profile. Mm -hmm. So I don't know what to do to try to help her restore her joy of, of learning and understand how great math is. And, you know, there's this tension I, between, you know, getting the right answer, getting good grade, and, and really having the joy. I think in general, the message that I always gave to my children is that it's the journey and not always the end result. And that's why whenever they were talking about, will it help me for to get into college? Will it, and putting the pressure on the result, whether it's the grade or getting into college, that to continue to talk about the journey and not just the response and, and that she gets something right or wrong. And even the struggle itself sometimes, she, she may have gotten to a, an area in math that is more difficult for her and that's okay. And enjoy the struggle as you go through it. It's going to be okay. And enjoy the journey as well and not just look at the end result and where, where she's going with that. I, I would maybe say something along the lines of um, looking for one small piece where she did well, where it brings back the joy of the math, not so much the grade, but that she studied really hard for it in a, a part of a, uh, one of the questions that was incredibly difficult to her before that she was actually able to answer, but did, maybe didn't answer all of the other questions on the test, but that one particular one she was happy about and she felt good about it. Because I think the small little moments where you're feeling good allows all the other things to come back. And being happy is, in my world, is way more important than getting the A on the test. And if my kid isn't happy, I want to figure out why they're not happy, not so much why they didn't do well on the test. And you said she had such joy doing the books before. Maybe there's some other books out there that she can find that she can do well on and makes her happy again. And then it will move over back into the test. Also, she can look back at her problems that she's done and seen that maybe she is able to do six of the steps right, but then she makes a careless mistake at the very end. And so she, the answer isn't right, but the process was correct. And maybe she can identify where she's having difficulty. If, and maybe the teacher can also look back. The whole process, particularly in math, is all about um, the getting to the right answer, but the process itself too is important, and perhaps she's doing most of it right. We have ten minutes, so we probably can have like two more questions. Um, I think you raised your hand before. Uh, yes, uh, just one quick question. Um, seems that there's a lot of support for the kid to give advice, but what support uh, are the parents getting? I said a group that the parents meet. You know, in, in addition to the way you know you give them advice too, but you know. Ten parents have the same issue. So those ten parents at some point had an opportunity to meet and say, this is the way I am, and mm -hmm. this is the way I would advise it, and this approach is successful. Um, I certainly recommend some of my parents to talk to other parents at the same school. So that's always the best way to understand what's happening or what's going on or you know what happens on parents' weekend, that kind of thing. Um, it's more of an individual thing, but they certainly still have me as the resource. Um, and some of the schools have uh, groups of parents that meet um, to discuss exactly the kinds of problems, and that's set up by the schools, and some don't have it. Sabrina and I have been talking to different, to somebody about getting parents from different schools together and creating a forum so that they can talk about their children who are struggling at school or whatever the issue is and we are trying to set some of those up but within the schools occasionally they do have that. Uh, so I mostly work with groups and the ones who are school age they're only five and six year olds right now um, I think actually the oldest is um, in first grade and it's an incredible support system for them but they meet all the time so we might meet monthly but they meet 
every week, and they really have created such a network for themselves. But we do, they do start so early. Um, some groups start later, and they decided in kindergarten that they need to get together. But it is so wonderful when parents have each other to talk to. It's also great just to find out that you're not the only parent going through that. Then all of a sudden, it's OK. You don't even need the solution so much as to know that you're not crazy or failing. And our training clinic actually has two parenting groups. One is for adolescents, and the other one is for uh, toddlers, little kids. And basically, it's because we want to ta teach our students equip them with the skills to run parents group because it is important. And these are children that don't have any label, any diagnosis, it's just open to parents that would like to have a forum to talk of things and be like a support system for them. Um, also, I was a facilitator at one point for a group called Parents in Action and we went, mm -hmm. yeah, we went to all the schools and w it helped in different areas so the parents within that school would all get together with a facilitator and they would discuss guidelines. What, what time do you put your child to bed? Is your child going out to parties? Are they traveling around the city by themselves? So you can talk to other parents and see what they're doing and come to some consensus at times or not, but just see what the parents of the children of the same age are doing. Yeah, yeah. Um, I would imagine that one almost upbringing really speaks to what, you know, your values as an adult. So I'm just curious, um, what was one thing that maybe your parents or guardians did that you wanted to emulate or something that you mm. wanted to do drastically differently from your own upbringing? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> My, my mother um, is, uh, well now she's retired, but she was a teacher. And so she always brought a lot of rituals into our house, just because she liked to make, she, she, I think she just liked to create those special experiences, special celebration days for pretty much anything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and I thought that was, that I still look forward to those things. She does them with my children and I try to do them and I also, um, always hope that the other parents that I work with can um, come up with their own or try to think back to their own. Um, I had really permissive parents though, so I'm trying to be a little bit, have better um, <laughs> limits. I could do whatever I wanted to any time, and it was a, it's a terrible, um, think how much more I could have done. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it was, it was too, too permissive, so I, I always think about that. And I think I grew up in a time also where parents were much less involved than they are today, mm -hmm. and we also had a fairly permissive household. Um, and so at first I wanted to be completely hands-on, but then you become like the helicopter parent as well. So I learned that there's got to be some sort of a balance. There is something wonderful. We're talking about the college situation, and I think my parents looked at me when I was a senior in high school and said that I, I was the youngest of five, so they kind of looked at me like, weren't we supposed to apply you to college? I'm like, I've done it, it's good, it's good, I did it. That was at a, that was maybe one extreme, but you know, I don't want to be too involved and in jumping in with my children. So somewhere I tried to get kind of a balance um, with that because my, I wanted to go completely the other way and not always the best idea. <laughs> It's funny, I grew up in a household with lots of rules, so, Ooh. Ooh. Um, but I did not go the other way. My, I have rules, um, had rules. My kids are no longer in my home, although they do come back a lot, and I still have rules, like dishes go in the dishwasher, not the sink. Um, it, it's annoying to me. Um, I think the thing that I did learn from my parents is to always give back, and I have really tried to instill that in my children, mm. so, I, it's been a joy really to watch all three of my kids do that in you know a lot of different ways. Um, my daughter did you know the random act of kindness thing at school. She started that, and so that's come become like a school wide thing where you find at an odd moment candy bar in your dorm room, things like that, just because you can, or <laughs> even just to say, "Hey, how are you?" with a smile on your face. Um, so that, that's something that I really feel is important with my kids, is, is to give back of your, of your time and of your patience and of you as a person. Last question.
trust me and our conversations are mostly about listening and what you said about diffusing that noise. And from 15 minutes, they can go to an hour. But if I work with like a professional development, I look about five years younger than they're guessing, and then I don't have children, so it's a lot of mostly mm -hmm. talking to that rather mm -hmm. than some of the other issues. Um, hmm, that's a really good question. It is so, it's such a hot um, button issue, parenting, and certainly when you're in the position as a teacher to have to talk to the parents about their child, and when, and this happens all the time, you're, if you're not a parent, this, that's not, um, but you have experience in the classroom, is that, I'm assuming, <laughs> um, and, and taking on that role from the beginning is a gr usually is a great way to establish um, a rapport that that's the area that you know very well, you know these children very well, and y you have so much experience seeing this, so they can, they, they want that information. But in general, whether you're a parent or not, it, I always have to be, I, I'm always very careful when I talk about parenting. I'm, I do make sure that everybody knows that I'm well aware that this is much easier to teach and talk about than it is to do, and so I never would want a video in my own household. Um, but it's much easier just from an objective point of view to have a conversation about what's going on, whether you're a teacher or any professional giving guidance. And that doesn't mean that you would do it any better. It just means that from the outside perspective, with your knowledge of child development and teaching, that you are there to help support them. And having that relationship with parents on you know as an ongoing kind of open door let's have a conversation let's be open and making sure that they aren't afraid that you're judging them I think that the judgment is what terrifies parents mm -hmm. yeah. they also in the pediatrician's office tend to lie all the time and I bump into parents just in the neighborhood that I work with and they'll have their they'll do something terrible that's not at all terrible and that I'm not paying attention to and they'll apologize to me and so it's so important to just make sure that they know that you're not judging you're just there to give support and information and for that they take from that what they can well, can I just ask you what your relationship with the parent is or teacher or I'm counselor a, I'm a classroom teacher but I also teach um, professional development at the school and so parents who are not in that classroom come for support with uh, about um, their children or about their children usually it um, rotates based on a different topic each month. I was saying to Caroline on our way up here that um, even though you might not be a parent, I, it's going back. I, I'll get to what I had said to you. Even though you're not a parent, the fact that you know this much more than the person sitting across from you should give you some confidence that you're able to talk about that piece and that's what's the mm. most important and being non-judgmental and being supportive and just have a little confidence in what you know mm -hmm. that they're looking for that answer they might know it on some level but they just want to hear it from a professional that I'm on the right track. So what I had said to Caroline on the way up here is that we know maybe a little bit more, but not really, but it comes across as, I do know a little bit more than you in one area of something, but I can always learn from somebody else. Thank you so much to Jill, Caroline, and Alyssa for sharing uh, your expertise and knowledge with us. We really appreciate it.